the economy over in America. So it's uh, this, this, uh, so it's, uh, it's the motivation. It's, it's for me the inevitable outcome. It's a logical conclusion of this developmental process, economic development. It had to come to this. And uh, I don't think it can last. You see, I think it's going to create such problems that we will return to the local economy because the local economy will be the only way of dealing with the problems. I mean, take a case of unemployment. As you know, uh, there have been no jobs in agriculture for a long time. In America, it's 2.7% of the workforce. Nothing. Uh, there are jobs in industry, but uh, that's gone. Now, the industry is going the same way as agriculture. It's down in America to 18% of the workforce. It'll be down to 12% within the next five, six, seven years. So where are the jobs going to come from? The answer is services. But the services are going the same way as, in, as industry and agriculture. They're becoming automated, robotized, and computerized. And don't forget, we're going through the greatest industrial revolution of all time. I mean, it's, it's very much the same, if not worse, than the, than the industrial revolution at the end of the 18th century. The computer is transforming industry, transforming the workplace. It's leading to outsources and outsourcing, I think they call it, and um, the restructuring of industry, removing whole echelons of management, it means transforming the way it works and cutting down massively on the number of people it employs, not just the, the unskilled labor, but skilled labor of all sorts. And this is occurring at the same time as we're losing jobs massively to uh, countries where labor costs are so cheap. You see, in a sense, when in a country like England you sign the GATT agreements, you are saying, <clears throat> you are writing off the working classes. You're saying, gentlemen, we don't need you anymore. We've got, we can get labor 40 times cheaper in China. What do you want to employ you fellas for? Uh, we don't even need you as consumers because we can export all the stuff we make to places where people are, are richer than you, to Germany, Japan, America. And of course, we can't afford a welfare state because how can we possibly compete with the Chinese if we have to pay for the welfare state? So uh, look after yourselves and if you're not happy, we'll send in the police. We don't actually say that, but that's what's implied. And that's what we're doing. We are writing them off. They have been sacrificed. Now, but it's not the only people who've been sacrificed. We're sacrificing small farmers. Now, in, uh, in France, uh, there were four million small farmers after the war. There were one million left. They're going. They blocked off Paris. They're revolting. In India, there are 600 million of them. Uh, they're going to go too. I mean, they won't because I think, you know, how, you gonna, how can you marginalize and render destitute 600 million people? It's going to be very difficult, you see. It's a challenge. It's a challenge. The problem is there aren't going to be any jobs. That's as simple as that. There's a man called Jeremy Rifkin, who's a well-known writer on all these different subjects and a campaigner, who's written a book called The End of Work. And he's literally said, that's what he says, there's just not going to be any work. The least saleable commodity in the world today is unskilled labor. It's unsaleable. Uh, that doesn't bother me too much. In the long run... Uh, and, and I hate it in the meantime, but in the long run, it doesn't bother me at all, and I think it's a matter for rejoicing. Uh, the issue comes not how you provide jobs immediately. The real political issue is how you share the available work. And I don't know of any political party that's asking that question or devising policies to do it. And that may mean logically working for 20 hours a week for a living wage. Is there any problem? We with could that? do that. Yes, we could. We could do it. There's a problem. Oh, there are lots of problems. Yeah, but as you already you're doing it, because mm. in, in England now, if you want to compete, it's same in America, same everywhere. If you want to compete with third world countries, where labor costs are so low, you've got to cut down the cost of labor by every means. Mm. There were all the, the corporations asking for flexible labor. And uh, you're, 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 you're replacing uh, people on long-term contracts, people on short-term contracts. And full of centre workers in the States are peace workers. They are. The biggest employer of labour in America <coughs> is now a company called Manpower. It employs 500,000 people and, you know, will provide people for a month or two. Mm -hmm. Attempts. And they'll, even, they'll even provide a, 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 they're, they're people who are vice presidents of corporations who've been hired for three months. So you're hired on short-term basis. And it's also part-time work. It's replacing long-term work. Now, the trouble with part-time work, and the people who like working part-time are more, most likely to work part-time are women. So now in England, you've got 15% unemployment among men, but only 4% among women, because women are being employed part-time, very low, very, very, very low salaries. The trouble is with all this, part-time work is how the hell are you going to feed your family? You see, working for pittance, part-time, that's what's happening with no welfare. The fact is, it's not going to work. Because people are just not, unless, of course, you created a conditions in which you didn't need so much money. I mean, if you live in a mud hut in Bihar, 
you can live on $50 a year maybe. But you try living on $50 a year in, uh, in a big city like Los Angeles with all the freeways and motor cars and telephones and electricity and everything else, you can't. You see, okay, let's say we're going to be poor, we can work part-time and then get enormous bulldozers and bulldoze the whole thing. I suppose the earthquake did part of the job last year in Los Angeles. But you need a lot of earthquakes and you need to bulldoze all this stuff and replace it all with a few mud huts and then you can solve the problem and work half time. <laughs> but uh, there, are. there are people living in Los Angeles on about $50 a year and they have wheels. They have uh, supermarket trolleys and you see them in the street with all their possessions in these. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And they live in the parks. Perhaps, yes. Now, I'd rather live that way in Los Angeles than London or Glasgow. Warmer. Or yeah. North America. Yeah. yeah outside of, of the Californian coast. Teddy, just come back a minute. Um, not many people know that this shifting of work to low-wage, relatively high-skilled areas, yeah. the Boeing aircraft industry now produces over half of all its products in southern China. Well, there you are. That's... Not in the north and west coast of the United States. Over half is going there now. And why? Because they do it so much cheaper and, interestingly, with so few rejects exactly. that there's just no comparison between the two. Now, this is terrible for the people who are losing their jobs, but look at it on a world scale. This is a way in which the world is progressively evening itself up. And that's a plus. Well, it's not evening itself, it's evening up in that sense of the term. You're going to get, uh, but in a country, a country like India, or even worse, China, it's all, it's, it's um, uh, the destruction of the global society in the third world. In these countries, it's going to be something ghastly. You've got a billion peasants in China. The, uh, the government already admits there'll be 280 million unemployed within the next few years. They're talking quite happily of shifting 400 million people to the cities by the year 2040. In reality, it's about a billion people they've got to shift. The jobs are not going to be there. They're not going to be able to put up any infrastructure. Uh, what they're trying to do is impossible. You're creating poverty and misery on a scale we've never seen before in the third world mm. as well as in our world. So it's, uh, it, uh, it's, uh, they're, 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 they're no winners except for a few transnational corporations who are going to get cheaper costs in the world market. That's all. But now, the answer to me, for me, there is only one answer. And that is that you've got to forget about jobs and return to the notion of livelihood. And people have got to work locally for their, in their families and communities, you see, and produce food for themselves, and produce all the things they need to produce, and say to hell with comparative advantage. And it doesn't matter if we make shoes in our village here. Uh, it doesn't matter if these shoes are twice the price of the shoes you'd make in China. So what? You know, at the moment in England, the England has hardly got a manufacturing base. It's all going. You see, you export, you find, you buy apples cheaper in France, so they grab up all the apple trees in Kent. It doesn't occur to people that tomorrow the apples might be more expensive in France, or there might be a revolution, or a strike, or, or uh, an epidemic of the apples or something. And then you try to get these apples back again. How do you do it? You see, all the people who know how to grow the apples have gone, the trees have been grubbed up, you see. The varieties you grew in England have disappeared. The land has been cemented over. You see, you're, 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 all you're doing, you're, you're, it's such incredibly petty-minded, short-term thinking that it's a joke. It doesn't matter if the apples are cheaper in France. You want to produce them in Kent, you go on doing it. You want, if you want to make shoes in your village, you make the shoes in your village. To hell with the fact that you can buy them cheaper elsewhere. You've just got to forget about this. It's nonsense. It's no comparative advantage. It's not going to it now, but it does not apply. It does not take into account a host of very important social, ecological, and human factors. So forget about it. You need to return to the local and produce things you need, certainly the basic things. We import certain things. There always has been trade. Even the Australian Aborigines had trade with Indonesia. You always had trade, but not necessarily in all the essential goods that you need for, to live. And the villages and small communities have got to be busy. They've got to produce all the things they need. Otherwise, how the hell can you have a community if it's not busy producing things? 